Monty is uh, co-host and managing director at Mass Digi. Uh, he's helped start the uh, gaming initiative in, in Worcester and been uh, highly involved in that. Uh, he's also he also runs his uh, company and he's an entrepreneur himself at Vivox. And uh, what I got quickly from the uh, 30 seconds I spent at the speaker's table was he started his career in online dating. So I'm not sure exactly how that weaves into everything, but I'll let Monty. Uh, do that, and without further ado, I want to introduce Monty Sharma. I, I used to work in software as a service, and then uh, when we started Vivox, we were looking at online dating and games. And going to dinner parties suddenly became so much more interesting, because nobody cared about software as a service, but dating and games, awesome. We stopped dating because uh, our wives insisted. So uh, moving on to games, <laughs> I, what I wanted to do was pull some things that I've seen in the game industry and how games are developed that are just generally useful things that we don't see being done in a lot of places. So um, I'm going to trip through these things fairly quickly, but happy to talk more with anybody. Um, Mass Digi, we're the statewide center for economic development and academic cooperation. Really what that means is if you're a student, we want to help you become a better employee. If you're a startup, we want to help you grow and be better off. If you work for government, we want to explain what video games are all about to you. That's, that's really what we do. And uh, it's a lot of fun. We get to work with some really amazing people all over the place. And, um, you know, uh, we love it. So. Uh, pictured here is a ship from a game, EVE Online. Ostensibly, to build that ship, when this actually happened, it took 4,000 people cooperating for about a year to build what became this ship. Imagine what it would take you to get 4,000 people unpaid to coordinate themselves to build something that would be useful for your business. And that's the power of games. That's what games can actually do, is they drive these motivations and behaviors that are extremely valuable. Games is a big business. It's a $100 billion business. Um, there's problems we deal with. It, cost of acquisition's high. Games get very expensive. So if you're familiar with Grand Theft Auto V, it cost $200 million to make, $500 million to market it made a billion dollars in the first 24 hours, so it's not bad ROI on that, but it's a big thing. Several years ago, though, we ran into a problem. Um, cost of acquisition was high, and we weren't really, get, the cost to get a player was very, very expensive. So there was a movement during that time to get into what, um, was moving away from the straight up pay. So in Asia, there was a problem with a lot of piracy. Um, and by Asia, I mean China. Uh, <laughs> it, uh, there, was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of piracy, so they wanted to move to a different way, and these were online systems that were connected together. One of the parts there was the concept of free to play. And free to play essentially looks at the sort of cost curve and says, Look, right now we pick one cost, right, or one price, I should say. Um, I think I had price there before and switched to cost. Getting old. Um, we pick one point, and we expect, okay, we'll get this many users for that price point, right? The problem is, is on either side of that price point, we're losing money. There are people who would give us money that aren't. A uh, perfect example is Evernote. I like Evernote. It's a really nice program. I use it a lot. But absolutely nothing that they want $99 for is useful to me. Now, I'd be very happy to give them $10, right? I might even be happy to give them $20. But what they've done is they've essentially set a threshold of $99. There's nothing in between. So what, they've, what they're doing is they're losing the business from people like me. So essentially, free to play goes at it and says, look, we'll take money from anybody. And there'll be people who play games who pay nothing. In fact, the vast majority of people who play mobile games pay nothing. 
they create an environment, they create a population there that makes that game interesting and more valuable. They market the game for you by driving it up on the charts. People come in, they pay what they like, and as time goes on, you find people that really connect with your game. And there's whales out there that are paying thousands of dollars a month to play Candy Crush. Okay? And that's the kind of thing that you know, free to play brings you. It drops that barrier to entry, makes it easier for you to get players in. It lets you take every cent that's available to you. Um, it really drives up that user base. It drives up revenues as well. So the revenues compared to a, um, what we'd call a premium game, you're seeing multiples of that. So instead of paying $2 for this game, I pay nothing. Um, in fact, the game I'm playing right now, I paid nothing for it, and I've spent $35 so far. If they had priced the game at $5, I never would have tried it. Having tried it, I'm very happy to pay $35 in it. Um, I need to manage that, but uh, <laughs> it'll get better. Uh, a couple of case studies. I worked with a group that had a package of things to help teachers. And what they wanted was $99. And this helped teachers manage a bunch of things. And they said, oh, you know, it's great. It saves them hours and hours. But it was $99. They couldn't get any users. They had two or three users who really liked it. But that was it. They went back at it and said, look, we're going to give you this part for free. But you're going to pay us on a, on a usage basis. And through that, they actually drove up a huge spend and the business was actually able to survive. Um, this is what we're seeing over and over again, and it, it baffles me many times when I look at business software, where they've set an artificial threshold in a way that it's stopping people who, wants, who want to give them money from doing that. So free to play is an important concept, and it's, it's all around understanding the value of what you're doing to your user and how they consume that functionality. Um, <clears throat> games are really about learning, all right? A, a game is an interesting thing. If you sit there and you go like this, after about 30, 40 seconds, you look like an idiot, but you also, you know, it doesn't, doesn't do anything for you. It's not fun. You take that movement and you tie it into a well-designed game and people will play till their fingers bleed. And that's a really interesting environment in terms of what that's able to do to that person, to connect with them and to carry them through. Um, a game like World of Warcraft, which I actually don't remember their current number, something like six million users right now. It starts off and the UI is really, really simple. Right? There's not much there. And then it can get really crazy. Uh, the game has to take the player from here to here. And that, that movement, that education, that learning is all entrenched in how that game is designed. It's what we call compulsion loops. So a compulsion loop is something that makes a person want to take that next step. And we look at these things in different lengths. So a short-term compulsion loop, I want to do this one thing. I have to kill a wild boar. Great, I killed a wild boar. If I kill 10, I get a prize. Well, OK, now there's a reason for me to keep going. As I do this, I'm presented with more and more things that, that carry me out. One of the groups that does it really well in the business world is airlines. I fly. I'm, I get gold status, which is actually pretty pathetic. Um, but you know, I don't have to pay for baggage fees, and I get on the plane first. Not bad. Um, I fly more. I get platinum which means I get on the plane before the guys with gold status um, and uh, you know, a few other little benefits. So each of those things carries me a little further. American Airlines kind of has me because they have their million mile thing. I'm at 870,000 miles and I've stopped flying a lot, which is a bummer because once you hit that million miles, you're actually able to hold that gold status forever. It's those sorts of things that here's a small win, here's a victory, here's an opening point 
where you're going to learn something, you're going to accomplish something, and then you take that accomplishment and you add it together. Uh, as you bring all these things together, you have a flow that carries people through things. Now, this gets pulled into gamification, and I know we're going to hear more about that later. It works well when it's well designed for certain groups of people. The one thing to always keep in mind is games are kind of like music. There is no song that's good to, for everybody, right? Uh, you can pick a demographic and say, there are not a lot of young women, there are a, there's a good number of young women who don't like Taylor Swift, right? That's not an unreasonable statement. Games are like that. So when you build and design games and you look at it, it really has to fit your community well, because if it doesn't, you won't get the um, you won't get the connections and the usability that you want. One of the big things with um, building out compulsion loops is that sense of progress. People like to see they're getting somewhere, and so if you look at Fitbits or Apple Watch or any of those things, it's all about here's a sense of progress. You've gone this far, awesome. Uh, at the end of the week, if I hit all my move targets, my watch says, hey, you did great. Do you want to go up a little next week? And bit by bit, it's moving me forward. That feedback and the interest on the part of the user in terms of the data and what's happening is a big thing, and that's all part of that motivation. It is the understanding of accomplishment. And so taking people through that and giving them the stats, and the details as to what they've done is an extremely useful tool in building out these loops. If you, um, actually, I'll save it for later, but if you want to talk about enterprise software and uh, that, we can do that later. Um, the big things in sort of lining those up, you know, in a game, it's make a match, clear level, uh, gain a unique uh, uh, skill or get something to, uh, that's flashy. For consumers, how do I get you to register? How do I get you to complete a workout in an exercise app? How do I get you to make a custom exercise uh, program? Because if you customize the program, I know that that's going to give you a better connection to that app I've given you. So taking people through all these things, and so uh, you know, I pull this from a game that's called Photocracy. It's a game, it's an exercise app. Um, and if you do it well enough, you become one of their heroes, right? And so it's all of these things to take you through a series of steps to get you to exercise, to get you to exercise and engage with their app, which then gives you feedback, which keeps you recording things in the app and helps you work through those loops. Um, a lot of the things that we look at in terms of analyzing this are analytics. You know, how many people are there on day zero? How many people are still there seven days out? How many people are there 30 days out? And the game, the app, all has to be optimized in terms of delivering value there. So how do I take you and say, okay, for D0, I need a short-term compulsion loop. What is it? How many people are actually completing that? I want to get to D7, D30. I need longer range targets, and I need to carry the users to each of those destinations. If I can do that, I've got somebody who's now used my app for 30 days. They're a customer. They're somebody I can actually do something with. So there's a lot of things of watching what people do. Analytics is entrenched in game design these days like nothing uh, I've ever seen. It's you're looking at the game, you're looking at the design ideas, you're putting the two of those together to understand what makes people start doing things, what makes them spend money, how do you put all those pieces together and carry it through. The third thing is engaged communities. So when you build a game, particularly a large game, you almost have to give up some of your ownership of the game. The player base becomes very, very connected to that game. And in being connected to it, they give you lots of feedback. They have lots of advice. They have all these other things. And it's the sort of thing that in a, um, in a large scale game, players will spend 15 hours a week engaging in content not related to the game. 
And we've seen this in certain places where software, uh, enterprise software, has a community that's actually interested in enough that they're generating useful content, that they're helping each other learn these things. If you can engage with your community, you can actually bring them along to, to be not just an evangelist for you, but to create useful things. Uh, a number of games have had tools and extensions and you know, what we'd call mods created by fans. People who've built stuff because they just like it so much. It doesn't make their job easier. It doesn't have that value. To, um, to do that, it really comes down to yielding some control. When you put out your product, your application, understand that you don't entirely own it anymore, that there is an ownership stake that your community has, that they actually care about this in some ways as much as you do. And in doing that, you have to listen to them. You have to treat them as you would your own employees. Um, it becomes the sort of thing that they matter, and it, it, it's, uh, it's something significant. You know, back when we used to, I was at Novell, and we do partner meetings and things like that, it was us talking to our customers, you know. And we do these round tables where we wanted to hear from them, but we weren't truly engaged in what they were doing and what they were thinking. You go to a fan event for a game, and there's very deep engagement. You see people getting into the guts of this and really wanting to talk about it. Um, there's always lunatics, right? Um, that's part of the human condition. Sometimes they're right. And it's always good to give everybody a chance to, to vent. Game companies hire community managers. It's one of the first hires as you start to grow is to bring in a community manager. Somebody whose entire focus is in talking to these users and, and being engaged and acting as that sort of representative of the community in internal discussions. If you look for leaders and reward them, and it's simple rewards, it's a title, it's a phone call, it's a, you know, a t-shirt, all these sorts of things end up being things that your community looks at and says, oh, wow, okay, so-and-so spent all their time doing this and they got a reward, that's great. I like it, this is good, you value us as a group. The more you listen and the more you f reflect back that, hey, here's an idea that we're undertaking and it's coming from our community. And community is a whole different f word than user base, right? It's coming from our community. It's coming from this group of people who care about this the same way we do. And we've talked to them and we understand them and this is what they're bringing forward. And we're taking this idea and we're sharing it with the rest of our community. And in doing that, that builds up that engagement, that builds those connections that help you keep the customer, move customers forward, and generate more value from it. Um, so quick summary, and you know, as we go through the evening, some of the other speakers are gonna touch on a number of these elements in greater depth, and there'll be questions afterwards, so happy to talk about that. But the three big things of Understand how to get the most money out of the, the, the customers, right? And it's giving them pricing that actually matches their interest in paying, not one price. Building compulsion loops. Give me a reason, give me signposts that I'm making progress in anything that I'm getting somewhere, that I've achieved something. All of those things will entice me to move through it further. And then engage deeply with your community and have them really be part of what you're building and have them part of what you're uh, delivering and that all will produce a better application, a better environment.